Good evening. Welcome to North Beat. I'm Megan Roberts. The Yellowknife Women's Society says that vulnerable people were left stranded during the city's evacuation. The organization published a detailed timeline that shows how the evacuation unfolded from its perspective. It claims that many people fell through the cracks, that they were getting calls from people looking for help. The society says many were confused about where to go and what to do, especially clients with no identity paper or money. You have folks that face barriers already existing within Yellowknife, and then we put them into a larger, like, city where they it's a completely new environment and then they're facing barriers due to their identity because they're indigenous because they experience homelessness they maybe they have like addictions issues you know there was a lot of things that were stacked against these folks the busky says the system failed them the Yellowknife Women's Society says some of its clients have not yet returned to the north and it reported two people missing the Northwest Territories government says ministers are aware of the issues and that a comprehensive discussion and examination is underway. NWT MLA Katrina Knockleby says she was doing what she thought was right for her constituents when she disobeyed Yellowknife's evacuation order. This comes after the NWT's integrity commissioner found she breached the MLA's code of conduct. Knockleby is the MLA for Great Slave. She says she would have been more helpful in Yellowknife because of her engineering background. But the commissioner says it strains credibility to say that her qualifications made her essential. In an interview with the CBC's Hillary Bird, Knockleby says she respects the decision of the commissioner, but defended her actions. If I had been a minister, there would have been no, I would never have left. And I can tell you that it really was fear mongering that made me leave to begin with. So then when I'm sitting outside of town, I'm wasting resources. I'm watching Bechico not be able to get food. The elders home worried about feeding the elders and all of this. Meanwhile, I know and I'm hearing what's happening in town and that the works that are being done are, you know, subdivision clearing, walking trails, filling the potholes, fixing up the bus stops. And then meanwhile, I'm hearing about our citizens that have been just dispersed, our vulnerable population across the South, uh, vulnerable Indigenous young women sent to Winnipeg, the missing and murdered capital of Canada for Indigenous and women and girls. But what were you going to do here uh, about all that? Why was it so important to, for you to, to come back here? Well, first of all, I just, I needed to have a place and a space where I felt like I could be effective. And sleeping on someone's couch for weeks on end is not going to do that. To me, I didn't see any difference in me physically being in Betchico than physically being in Yellowknife. And I do understand that, yes, I could have gone south. At that point, the road between here and Enterprise and all of that was becoming very unstable. I could have gone over to Simpson, but where was I going to stay there? I know that things were getting really crowded there. There was threatening points back and forth about the fires in Liard. The reporting on that was horrible. And at just that point, my mental health and exhaustion, I was like, I just want to go back. I need to know for myself what is going on. Because next week or in a couple of weeks, they're asking us to postpone elections at this point. As I'm evacuating, I'm being pressured to make decisions about the election. Meanwhile, most of the people are already gone. Like, it was, it was a lot of pressure. And I knew that we were coming in to be... Uh, um, we were going to be asked to approve almost a hundred million dollars, but that was even not even going to be what this part of it all was. That was just the stuff that had been spent to date. And I felt like as an engineer, as a leader, as somebody who's responsible to the fiscal well-being and the, the, the mental and, and physical well-being of our people, that I needed to see this for myself. Plus, I knew I had assets and things to offer. People are like, you had no skills. I'm a geological engineer. I... That was Great Slave MLA Katrina Knockleby. She broke Yellowknife's evacuation order during the wildfire. The NWT's integrity commissioner says she violated the MLA's code of conduct. He recommends Knockleby be fined $7,500 minus a $3,500 charitable donation she already made. She says she will pay the rest of the fine. It was a dramatic week for the Gwich'in Tribal Council. The organization held its annual General Assembly and things got tense. 
Before it even started, there was a lot of controversy with a forensic audit that found that communities were mismanaging finances and two presidents suspended. Sarah Kamalowski has been following the assembly. She joins me now to break it all down. So why don't you take us through some of the big moments of the assembly this week, Sarah? Absolutely. One of the biggest things that happened was that delegates voted out two Gwich'in Council presidents. One was Abe Wilson, the president of Tate Lake Gwich'in Council in Fort McPherson. The other was Mavis Clark, who was the president of the Gwich'in Council in Sigachek. Both have been suspended for a while, but they were permanently dismissed yesterday with a vote. There was also an update from the Gwich'in Development Corporation. It hasn't been super active for a while, but the council is really looking to get it started back up and to use it to create more jobs for Gwich'in. Uh, in the area and also to take on more government contracts. Finally, there was an update on how plans for self-government are going and the Tribal Council says that that's still a really big priority. Why don't we talk about the tone of this conference as well? I understand it wasn't exactly peaceful. It was definitely quite adversarial at certain points. There's a fair amount of tension between some of the delegates from communities and those representing the Tribal Council, especially in Fort McPherson and Sigachik. In both those communities, some of the core funding was withheld this year because of financial audits that were, weren't done. So that, together with presidents in those communities being suspended, meant people were not too pleased. Um, and at one point yesterday, delegates from Fort McPherson actually left the floor and met on their own to decide whether they wanted to stay at the assembly. Um, a lot of participants who are watching spoke out against the adversarial tone and some said that they felt there was bullying and called out delegates for not following Gwich'in values. Okay, and let's talk more. There's that forensic audit I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. Did we get any more details about that, Sarah? We didn't get too much information about that forensic audit. Grand Chief Ken Kikovicic gave a presentation with some details on the audit. It covered between 2015 and 2021. He did say the audit found there was a lot of spending done in communities without any records of it actually being approved by the councils. Definitely over $100,000 and maybe as high as around $700,000 over that time. And that included money paid to staff, vehicles purchased, and travel. He said the Tribal Council did has given some information to RCMP to investigate potential crimes. But overall, he said the biggest issue was bad record keeping. And he said that the Gwich'in Tribal Council has a plan to make financial reporting easier and better, starting with more training for the staff and communities and standardizing some of the forms and procedures. Okay, thank you so much for all of your coverage this week, Sarah. Thank you. Most people in Pungnuktu have their power back after a storm knocked it out for about half of the community yesterday. High winds took out power lines and temporarily prevented crews from coming in to fix them. The CBC's Emma Tranter has more. The damage in the community is widespread. Metal roofing for some residences and buildings were blown off, and power lines and poles are on the ground. This after winds gusting over 100 kilometers an hour bombarded the community Thursday night. This morning, the Kulik Energy Corporation tried to send a charter to the community for repairs, but it couldn't land because of the weather. Eric Lawler is Pugnatu's mayor. He says roughly 350 homes lost power in the storm. The house was shaking quite a bit. Um, I know many, many houses probably didn't have any of that heat. Um, by the morning, um, this morning, um, our house was pretty chilly. So we're lucky it's not in the middle of winter. Lawler also said one of the schools is being used as a shelter for those still without power. Tim Evick is a resident of Pangnatu. He says that some residents found ways to deal with the power outage. We are okay. I haven't heard any stories about anyone getting hurt. Some of us are using our generators. But most people don't own a generator, but some people are using a Coleman stove. QEC sent a second charter later in the day, and most of the community now has power. It says it will keep residents updated on their efforts through social media. Emma Tranter, CBC News, Iqaluit. There's a teacher shortage in Nunavik. The Katavik School Board needs 60 more teachers this year in all three languages, English, French, and Inuktitut. It's nothing new for the region. The shortage has been a problem for a long time. The president of the school board says they've been trying to hire teachers, but the struggle is never ending. A lot of teachers retired uh, in the early 2000s 
that's when we started to have shortage of teachers. Even though we uh, opened our job opportunities during the whole year, 365 days a year now, it used to be only one month during March and April, but now we keep it open all year round. Even though we keep it open all year round, we're still having a hard time to uh, hire teachers. Alupa says recent changes at the school board might reduce some of the shortage. Inuit who aren't certified teachers are now qualified for full benefits. Despite being short 20 Inuit teachers right now, Alupa is hopeful these changes will increase interest in the long run. Call Mayor says it'll be tracking country food being shipped out of the Kivadluk. This comes after the airline became suspicious that large shipments of meat were sent out for profit. The airline has an agreement with the Kivadluk Inuit Association. Beneficiaries can send country food at a subsidized rate, but only if they're shipping food to family and friends, not to make money. The company says it'll keep a close eye on daily inventory. It'll be watching for large shipments of meat and individuals sending out food more frequently. The company says it is not eliminating the subsidized rate. He was cleared this summer of assaulting RCMP officers at the Fort Smith detachment, but now the Crown is appealing that acquittal. Kelly Canadian is the man accused. He's filed his own complaint against the RCMP. He says officers used force against him and that the appeal is an attempt to justify it. It's kind of a pathetic way to justify excessive force used by the police. Hopefully whoever hears the appeal will see reason over madness. The Crown prosecutor said he wouldn't comment on the merits of an appeal before the court. A date for the appeal hearing has not been set. Johnny wanted to go back home. It was a thousand kilometers away. They forced them to go to the Indian residential school. More than 150,000 of us children had to go. They wanted to change us. Our Father in heaven, Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Kill the Indian and the child. It's been called cultural genocide. I survived residential school. My brother Johnny did not. Chani Wenjack was one of thousands of children who died due to Canada's residential school system. More than 80,000 survivors and their families still live with its legacy today. Norman Wells is saving energy and money in its arena with new LED lighting. We want to give the people in the community that use the arena the best experience that they can have. The application process was flawless and I would encourage uh, other communities to uh, look into this, this fund with uh, Arctic Energy Alliance. The Arctic Energy Alliance has free advice and rebates to help you switch and save. Talk to us today. Things are too good. I'm just scared that things will be taken away. Think of the education they will receive. You're going to see things you never forget. There is no way that we are going to give up when we are threatened with cultural genocide. Sometimes it's the beautiful things that hurt the most to remember. You promise me that you won't look back. You are our tomorrow. I am in the best place in the entire world right now. Oh, I always play with fire. This is an epic fail. <laughs> I'm obsessed with these. I am utterly speechless. <laughs> Keeping secrets, are you? No, sir. It's like any man. 
on the run. Whatever you're gonna do, you need to do it now. Hang on, guys. I'm sure you'll get some action. Promise? We were failed by history. It's really important that we own our stories. Every week, the issues that matter to Canadians. These are acts of desperation. Connecting politics to people. Some people have lost everything. Join me for Rosemary Barton Live. Fifteen Lego-like timber homes have sprung up in the forest outside of Watson Lake, Yukon. They're being created by and for members of the Liard First Nation through its economic development corporation, First Casca. The homes are being built as a game changer and an innovative solution to the housing crisis. Katie Todd has that story. The homes are built from numbered, pre-cut pieces of timber. It takes five days to prepare all the timber for one house at First Casca's new production plant just outside Watson Lake. And it takes just one day to assemble those pieces into the shell of a house. The goal is to become the first First Nation north of 60 without a housing crisis. We're taking raw resources, um, we're milling them ourselves, we're manufacturing them ourselves, we're building the homes ourselves, and. Uh, uh, and our people will be moving into them. So it's, it's definitely a, a paradigm shift that, uh, you know, we are taking control of our own destiny. The project has created about 50 jobs. For Mike Ganyan's son, who has battled leukaemia and dependency on alcohol, this job is a life-changing opportunity. He's grateful to work with his community. And Stephen's given him all kinds of uh, responsibilities and he's... And he's excelled at it. He's just, he's just taken it and, and, and run with it. I'm super proud of him. The houses range from one to three bedrooms. They feature eight inches of insulation on the walls and ten on the roof. That's well above code. Builders on the project say these homes are so cosy you could heat them with a candle. First Casker expects the first homes to be ready before the end of the year. It eventually hopes to export the homes to other parts of the Yukon, with other First Nations having already expressed interest. Katie Todd, CBC News, the Yukon. As the Canadian government tries to cut carbon emissions, it's taking a hard look at concrete. The industry accounts for up to 8% of global emissions. Now, a factory in Drummondville, Quebec, is trying to be part of the solution. It's selling a cement-free, carbon-negative concrete. Rowan Kennedy explains. For more than 50 years, Patio Drummond has used cement powder. It's an excellent way to bind water with rock, making concrete. But producing cement is one reason why construction pollutes so much. These blocks could be a solution. They're held together with a waste product from making steel instead of cement. In this curing chamber, CO2 is trapped inside the blocks. And as we inject the CO2, the calcium carbonate forms, and that's what binds the concrete and make it hard. An independent firm says carbocrete blocks are carbon negative over their life cycle. The company behind the technology says the carbon trapped inside offsets the CO2 released by making it a greener alternative to concrete blocks made with cement. Every ton of cement produced, there's a ton of CO2 produced, you know, and so if you look at the entire worldwide production, you're looking at, you know, 8% of GHG or, you know, about 4 gigatons. Last week, Patio Drummond put carbocrete blocks on sale for the first time after years of testing and investing tens of millions of dollars into the equipment. We use the same aggregates as we use in a regular, a regular block. The distributor says they account for a tenth of the cinder blocks it produces. Girardin says there's already demand, even though they sell for 30% more. The test we've done uh, shows that the longevity or the durability of the products is the same or even better than a standard block. I don't think one product will revolutionize the industry. This material science professor says carbocrete blocks are a step in the right direction. In my opinion, there's no one single solution to solving our CO2 emission problem. So I really welcome any and all new technologies that can fill a niche. These two curing chambers can make 2,400 carbocrete cinder blocks a day. Patio Drummond hopes to double that within a year. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Drummondville. The public is getting its first look at a fantastic fossil in Alberta. 
The 69 million year old skull is being called one of the country's greatest dinosaur discoveries. It's now on display in Drumheller, Alberta. Dan McGarvey has more on the rare find. It's a moment 69 million years in the making. The curtain gets drawn back on a huge fossilized triceratops skull. Caleb Brown with the museum says it's an iconic addition to the Royal Tyrrell's collection. We're very excited to have it and we're incredibly excited how well preserved it is. It's the, the best preserved, most complete tri uh, triceratops specimen from Canada. It was found after the 2013 floods near Pincher Creek as part of a museum project surveying new areas of Alberta for fossil deposits. The crew found more than 200 new fossil sites and collected almost 500 specimens, but the best thing they collected was this triceratops skull. Ian McDonald, a fossil technician at the museum, spent seven years of painstaking work bringing this fossil back to life. It's such a high quality specimen, like it's the, the bone is beautifully preserved and there's all that, I mean you've, you've seen like all the grooves and pits and ridges, like all that detail is lovely and it's, it's very ever so slightly deformed but it's essentially three dimensional and stuff so it's been a, a very rewarding project the whole way through really. You can see the Triceratops as part of the Royal Tyrrell's Fossils in Focus exhibit. Dan McGarvey, CBC News, Drumheller. A Northwest Territories soccer team is competing in a New Brunswick tournament this week. The team traveled to Moncton to compete at the Under-17 Nationals, and they took time from their busy schedule for a special side trip. Here's a look at how they're enjoying their time off the field. Well, I think for a couple players uh, who have never been to this side of the, the country, it's kind of a cool experience to come see the Atlantic. Um, and we don't have beaches in Yellowknife or nothing like this. So it's just a good, good chance to come have a day off, not, not uh, think about what's coming up in the tournament, to kind of just relax and uh, get ready for what's coming next. Our biggest challenge this summer was that um, we had the, the forest fires and we had to evacuate the city. Um, prior to the evacuation, we had heavy smoke and um, we got certain cutoffs in terms of air quality when we can't practice outside. Um, which was most of the time, so we had very limited field time. We were forced to either train inside or just cancel sessions. Um, and it was tough because we don't have indoor facilities that we can really train on. Uh, it's like a hockey rink with Velcro on it, so it's really tough to learn how to play the game properly. You've had your feet in the water. How does the temperature compare to uh, Great Slave Lake, what you'd experience in Yellowknife? Um, I was pleasantly surprised. It was actually quite warm compared to what we have. Uh, I have a couple of pictures of me swimming around little uh, chunks of ice uh, during breakup. So I'm pretty used to cold water and this was very, very nice for me. Tonight is the final night for Dreaming Roots, an Indigenous-led production at the Yukon Arts Centre. It features work from more than 50 Indigenous artists telling stories about the Yukon and its First Nations. Take a look. If I was describing this show to a six-year-old, I would probably say, you know when like Elsa starts singing and it gave you goosebumps? This will give you more goosebumps. <laughs> This show talks about and tells a story of this land that we know as the Yukon from the time before humans and up until the now and into the future. It's, it's like a, a wish or a dream for what a future can be like in this territory. When I think about Dreaming Roots, um, and what it makes me feel as a person and what my hopes are for everyone else that watches this show is that they come away with sort of more of a profound sense of where they are, where they belong, where they live, um, that they that not only are touched emotionally, like um, many people have said to me, you know, these little thoughts that I had or little dreams that I had, it was incredible to see them come to life in such a be beautiful way. This is one of these productions that I feel that is sort of a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> And that is North Beat for tonight. For news anytime, go to cbc.ca slash north. 
we leave you with a look at tomorrow's weather. Thank you for watching. I'm Megan Roberts. Happy Thanksgiving and have a great weekend. When I arrived in Canada, there were not many women who looked like me. Not everyone was welcoming. But my husband made a new life here in this distant country. And I thought here, here I could belong. And many others could too. As the years went on, our town flourished. Our community worked together and took care of each other. Our children grew up with a true sense of belonging. Here in Baldi, we built our home and we wanted others to do the same. Established by South Asian immigrants in 1917, the mill town of Paldi, British Columbia was one of Canada's first inclusive multicultural communities. Driving impaired destroys lives. A message from Mad Canada. Keeping secrets, are you? No, sir. It's like any man. Starting new. On the run. Whatever you're gonna do, you need to do it now. Hang on, guys. I'm sure you'll get some action. Promise? Putting on that apron brings me to tears. Hey! This is an epic fail. <laughs> Where are the pecans? I don't see the pecans. The stones. The Beatles. <laughs> I detest. What? We were failed by history. Look where we are under that legacy. It's really important that we own our stories. What Canadian creature is often a villain in fairy tales? Likes to talk to its family a lot. Hunts in large packs for big animals. And is a close cousin to dogs. If you guess the wolf, you're right. These mighty hunters are quite shy of people and fill an important role in nature. To learn more about wolves, visit our website at hww.ca. Just remain calm. Grab the head. You grab the head. Have you ever dealt with something like this before? No. Delicate! It's on me now! Animal Control. Watch all episodes now. It was awesome! It was great! I loved it. Yeah, yeah, good show. Both the comedy in with the history. With... He was really funny. <laughs> Nailed it. It was great. Still standing. Watch free on CBC Gem. I was homeschooled as a child. You can only be as smart as your mom, that's it. Gross. Okay, cool. Woo, I love it. 
Get the news you need without restrictions. Download the free CBC News app.